when it comes to prominent names within what is considered today modern Christendom, very few names have the same renown and respect as that of John MacArthur. Many people see this man as an excellent teacher of the Bible, and while the man has seen his fair share of controversies in standing for some biblical truths, the man has also subtly taught some of the worst heresies imaginable. One of his most obvious heresies is his stance on the Mark of the Beast. Let's listen to an audio clip from his ministry, Grace to You. It's in regard to the latter half of the tribulation period when, when men would be required to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. My question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the seven-year tribulation coming in the future, we're going to get into this so probably a week from Sunday night, maybe this Sunday night, maybe a week, I'm not sure. But um, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world in, with a series of holocausts, and at the same time, he begins to redeem his people, Israel. And in the process of this, the Antichrist establishes his rule, and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist, you have to take the mark of the beast. Now, the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period, and you take this mark, in other words, you identify with the beast's empire, will you still be able to be redeemed? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yes. Otherwise, there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to, it, to permanency any more than you being a part of this world system once in your life means you have to be a part of the system all your life. Now, that's what John MacArthur says, but what does the Word of God say concerning this? Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11 And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Revelation 20 verse 4 And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation 19 verses 20 to 21 And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Those who take the mark of the beast have, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Where does the scriptures make an exception to this? Answer, nowhere. If you go to the official Grace to You website and look at the article, What is the Mark of the Beast? You'll find it mentions passages like in Revelation 13, but doesn't reference what we just read concerning the torment that follows with taking it. Unfortunately, due to this statement by MacArthur, there are many quotations 
professing Christians who have defended his statements, saying, for instance, that there are sins listed within the Pauline epistles, such as 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 10, where it says none of these people listed shall inherit the kingdom of God, or Matthew 5 verse 22, where it says, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. The significance of having these verses taken out of context is to assume that since the Bible seems to suggest such strong condemnation for those things listed here, means that the word of God is not really saying that all those who take the mark of the beast and worship him and his image are lost, but rather would be worthy of eternal torment if they had not repented after doing so which is not actually what the Bible is saying, as we will now demonstrate. The problem for this line of thinking for 1 Corinthians 6 is that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different things, where the kingdom of God is found in those who believe, as found in Luke 17 verses 20 to 21. As it is not the physical kingdom, unlike the kingdom of heaven, but is a spiritual kingdom without boundaries. The context of the passage in 1 Corinthians is also about inheritance, as found with the works that shall be tried with fire in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 13 to 15. The other issue that is within Matthew 5 verse 22, when Jesus says, whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire, is that there is a clause commonly removed within new versions, which is where it says, without a cause. Remove that, and Jesus is a hypocrite and a sinner worthy of hell, as demonstrated in Matthew 23 verses 17 to 19, after he spends an entire chapter in Matthew 23 calling the religious leaders of the day the same thing. All of this to defend taking the mark of the beast, as if those people who are trying to justify it would actually make Christ a sinner in order to do so. The whole argument in defending the acceptance of the mark of the beast is also another instance of not rightly dividing the word of truth, as in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, where the new versions change it to rightly handling without any instruction on how to do so. The time of Jacob's trouble has as much to do with the church age as the time before Christ had died on the cross and the Jews were bound to the ordinances of the law of Moses. The time of tribulation that is to come is where God will redirect his full attention to the seed of Abraham as in the past, and the church is nowhere to be found in it. The body of Christ, with the movement of the Holy Ghost, is currently hindering the Antichrist system now, until, as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Which is leading up to God removing the church the same way that John was caught up in the beginning of Revelation. Those who take the mark of the beast would be of the many antichrists that accompany the will of THE Antichrist. As 1 John 2 verses 18 to 19 demonstrates, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You think that when the mark of the beast comes, you won't have fake professing Christians that will defend taking it? 
When Jesus described this time, he always started his discourse with, Take heed that no man deceive you. God is a God of distinction. To try to make the Bible say something it is not is highly suspicious. And anyone who tries to defend taking the mark of the beast should be suspected of having the same spirit that it belongs to. In conclusion, watch out for John MacArthur. The man might have the respect of millions, but God is no respecter of persons. <laughs>